Welcome to our Friday Focus video for August the 28th, coming to you from Franklin. This is a fabulous compilation of footage that was shot by some of the great master gardeners of Williamson County, as well as some of our own specifically for this segment. So you're going to learn about history, horticulture, some of the great service and educational projects there in the Franklin, Tennessee area, as well as food production for Middle Tennessee communities. So enjoy this great snapshot of Williamson County Master Gardener Projects. We're at the Carton Plantation. From the pictures and from the documentation we can find, we, we created this garden. A replication of what the, the, the slaves that lived in this building would have done with their own garden at that time. And everything is planted in here that they would have planted at that time. The tomatoes, cabbage, Usually, we would have cotton growing in here. We didn't do that this year. We'd have okra in here. We didn't put that in. We'd have broom corn, which was what they make brooms out of back then. The tomatoes that are grown in here primarily are all heirlooms that came from that garden up there on the plantation, the bigger garden. There's no doubt that history is, is amazing. It's fascinating. Almost every time you come out here, you learn something different. You talk to people who know about the place. Visitors ask you questions. Pretty, pretty interesting project. And the first year we put this garden in, it dawned on us that where, we, where the heck are we gonna get water? There's a well right over here, about 100 feet away. They gave us the okay to go ahead and dig a trench, six inches deep, and it was 80 foot long. We found all kind of porcelain dishes. We found a couple bone pieces. We found horseshoe nails. But you can imagine the stuff that's in this ground after all these years it's in this ground, that's why we couldn't dig in here. You don't know what you're going to find. We're preserving something historical that's, that's of Williamson County. It's a good group of volunteers that are putting the time and the effort in preserving this piece of history. We're at Historic Carnton Plantation, just outside of downtown Franklin, Tennessee. This is a recreated garden, recreated in the time period of 1847 to 1869. It's about one acre in size. We both grow vegetables and ornamental plants for beauty. The garden is, is oriented or laid out in an axial relationship with the back porch. The extension of the back porch leads you into the center of the garden where you'll have an urn surrounded by hydrangeas and roses. And then out from there, you, we have four rose quadrants. And then aligning those center rose quadrants would be our vegetable plots. This garden creates a real positive relationship in the community. Carnton wins when visitors and Williamson County Master Gardeners spend time here. The community wins when we have a beautiful historical recreated garden that they can enjoy. And then of course the Williamson County Master Gardeners win in the sense that they can come out here and just enjoy themselves or train on gardening techniques. You know, I'd love for people to walk into this garden and feel like they have been transported to 1850. Maybe look at history through the lens of a garden and through nature. Really, the most important thing that a visitor could come and take away is just a sense that nature is all around us and how powerful and beautiful nature is. You know, I've been the head gardener or the director of Gardens and Grounds since July of 2003, but this year has brought an unprecedented challenge in the sense that we had restricted or we had fewer visitors. And in order to, um, to deal with, with that, we, we made a decision to not plant vegetables this year. And when word got out to our best volunteer group, the Williamson County Master Gardeners, they stepped up and said, no, we will volunteer to plant your entire garden and vegetables and we'll maintain them and we'll harvest them this year for you. And so I want to give a huge thank you to the Williamson County Master Gardeners for, for stepping up and looking at the garden not just as a place to work, but a place to really build a community and grow together. Thank you. Those of us that like horticulture and those of us that like history this is a place to be. Since the Williamson County Master Gardener Association took over in 2004, we've had a, a large effort to really make it look like it was in 1870 after the war. And so we have an orchard, we have vegetable garden, 
We have various perennial and annual beds. The fruit that we have and the, uh, the vegetables, we try to donate to various charities who need the food really bad. That's always appreciated. In order to get the, uh, the vegetable garden and the orchard going, we were aided by a very meticulous records and, and journals that Moscow Carter had in uh, 1870. With his records, we were able to plant not only the same seven varieties of apple trees that he had, but the row order that he had. Now, he had over 400 trees. We don't have that much room. We have 69. The main thing is, is to uh, make it look like it was in 1870 so that 40,000 or 50,000 visitors that we have here, they can appreciate what it was like in a southern town to rebuild after the Civil War. It was very tough, but we're trying to make it look like that. If I have problems with uh, a disease or insect, the first thing I do is go to the Extension Center in here in Franklin and uh, get some help there. And then also uh, I get a whole uh, wave of people, let's say, in, uh, in Knoxville that's willing to help. They actually come here and, and take a look at things and, and give us some advice as to what to do. It's a good learning exercise. We share knowledge with each other. We have fun doing it. This garden is known as the Edible Uprising because absolutely everything in the garden is edible for either humans or our pollinator friends. It's the farmer's market. Everybody comes to the farmer's market at some point or another. On Saturday, this is the most visible of the gardens. It was established here several years ago to begin to show different ways to the public that you could raise vegetables and herbs and stuff in small spaces. Also, if they have areas that they can't garden because there's tree roots, whatever, we've shown them how to use straw bale gardening or vertical gardening. People in general have those same problems. Now, I don't have all the answers, but I can tell them where to go get the answers, which is to the Master Gardener's website and to the different resources we have available. This year, our intern projects were to create six foot by three foot demonstration gardens to show how much you can do in that amount of space. So we have a pizza garden, we have a salsa garden, and at the other end we have a drought tolerant garden. Because we don't use anything to treat our plants, they can pinch off some, they can put some in their salad. Well, people walk by and ask things, but we love to take samples from the different th plants here. It's been a little bit more work than we initially anticipated, but it's been well worth it. We are at the Giving Garden. It's about five to six acres. 12, 13 tons of food that we get here. It's a pretty big operation. It's not a one or two person job. Siberian kale is one, all right? Okay, these are radish seeds, okay? This is a fantastic place to take what you learn in the classroom, come out here uh, and put that into practice. We'll get some seeds, about like this right here, okay? We would hope to get enough coverage over out here, okay? If we don't get it covered, then nature is going to cover it with weeds. This whole giving garden started with pumpkins so kids could see how pumpkins grew. And over the course of years, then they started adding more and more types of things to it. And it has really grown into something that God knew what it was going to grow into, but we didn't know what it was going to grow into. I really like the mission. Right As I understand, like one in six people uh, go hungry in Franklin and Williamson County. Can't feed all of those folks, but you're looking at uh, growing a little over 12 tons of food, and that's a lot of food uh, that can make a little dent uh, in that area. It goes beyond just what the garden is here, right here, uh, which I think is pretty cool. That partnership, at least for me, that's a personal way where I specifically know how in the weeds, literally in the weeds, I would be if I did not have the help of the master gardeners. I mean, it just makes all the difference in the world to have some of the people out there that you can ask questions to and say, what do you know about this? That looks good, kind of. I mean, Simon will be the one that says, he'll go, I don't know anything about that, but he knows he has a group that he can go back to and he can say, what do you know about this? And that is really very, very valuable. I'd say this is, has been the strangest year I can remember in my life. It started out with tornadoes 
in February that devastated Middle Tennessee. And before we could even clean it up, we all got sent to our rooms with COVID-19 lockdown. And it was really frightening because our organization has a large number of people who fall into that high risk group, either for age or health reasons, or they take care of a parent or they have children at home. So it was a real time of fear, I think more than anything else. And we couldn't figure out how to help in our community. We were homebound, literally. But everything started crashing at one time. We went from being in class on Wednesday to on Friday being totally, totally locked down. The first thing to crash, of course, was our plant sale in April. So all the master gardeners who had been growing plants for the sale were left with hundreds of plants with nowhere to go. So everybody jumped on their neighborhood watch page. They called friends, they called relatives, they put them at the end of the driveway, come by, pick them up. And with every one of them, I put in a slip of paper that says, this is our website. You can find research-based information here to help you. There were so many people doing first-time gardening. And it was no surprise because our um, distribution lines were disrupted. There was nothing coming in from overseas. Um, chicken and meat packing plants were closed because of COVID infection. It was a no-brainer that the grocery bill was going to get really high. So we had a lot of input via email and phone calls and the website with people just starting. And you know we labeled them Victory Gardens because that's exactly what they were. Um, from then on, things just snowballed. As you know, you know, Fourth of July fireworks, rodeos, 4-H, everything shut down. Uh, I think probably one of the hardest hit groups was our Speakers Bureau. Uh, they had no time to adjust to the fact that they would not be standing in front of people in a library. The libraries went down. But they quickly, with the help of our IT team, they quickly jumped in, they learned how to Zoom, and then they were able to offer our community Zoom-based with the library's assistance. Um, so they still had to register, so the library knew how many people were logging on, and they have done a phenomenal job. No, we have not been able to do as many talks as we would have if libraries had been open, but they've certainly filled in the gap in a very quick amount of time. The group that was hardest hit were our Master Gardener interns. They had four classes. They went from that fourth class on Wednesday to a complete and total lockdown on Friday. No more classes, couldn't leave their house. Again, I had some high-risk people in the class, but Natalie Bumgarner and her team jumped in there. They created YouTube videos. They were available to do Zooms if people had specific questions. <clears throat> and we did Zoom about uh, planting vegetables when everybody was getting ready to start. Uh, remember, this is a new class of gardeners. Um, so they had a lot of questions, and then Amy Dismuk zoomed with them about beneficial insects in the garden so they didn't go out spraying ladybugs. Um, but the, the hardest thing was the volunteer time. This is where, you know, they have to earn 40 hours. So although we'd covered their educational component, they still need to get out and get 40 hours. And this was really difficult, and we could not have done it had the project leaders not gone all out to make every environment as safe as possible. This was a good year for me. In this particular garden, all the interns needed their hours, and they wanted to go somewhere they were pretty safe and pretty secure. So we set it up so that only four people could be here at the same time. And I had a, a whole calendar schedule, and people would you know put dibs on what time they were going to come and stuff and as we got more you know reduction in requirements we were able to have more people here but yeah even now there's there's relatively few people here at one time and everybody by now knows what they're doing and they're in the rose quadrants going after the weeds or going after the seeds or whatever they do nobody's tripping on each other it's not the kind of volunteer opportunity where you're on top of each other it's a big garden when they closed the carton plantation and there was nobody at all then i figured you know what I can't, this is too small of an area to, you know, to have safe social distancing. So what I'm going to do is not get groups out here, one person at a time. So I let everybody that works on this project know, 
You can work in the garden as many hours as you want. You can come as often as you want, but no more than one person at a time. Just let me know what hours you want to be here, what days you want to be here. And so, so about three or four people popped up and said, hey, I'll do this. I'll come and weed and uh, I'll come and put the pine straw down and I'll come and plant some things. So I ended up with about four people that really start coming on a regular basis. And between them and myself planting the tomatoes and, and the cabbage and things, we ended up with this. And we, we got 28 plants in here that are, that are half of them are grafted. And this, this experiment is really moving along pretty well. We're out here in the open. We're not in the closed uh, quarters of anywhere. We don't wear masks out here. Uh, we don't have to. We're, if there is any social distancing, we're social distancing here. We usually don't have more than five or six people out here at a time, and sometimes less than that. And uh, so I have to decide as a project leader, well, who's working on what? What do we need to do? What's most pressing? What's the priority? And uh, they go through and do it. We have a lot of volunteers from church. I would say we probably have about 25 or 30 people. Most of us are over the age of 65 um, who do the bulk of the, of the work, uh, the main work. But I would say three, maybe 300 people from the church will come occasionally, once a week, once every two weeks. But we also have a lot of people. I mean, if it weren't for the Master Gardeners, that, that is a huge part of our, uh, particularly now during COVID, it's really helped. Um, but, but all the time, that, they have always done a lot of their hours here. And a lot of them come back and volunteer even after they've done all their 40 plus hours. So it makes us feel like they feel part of the family, which is nice. We had to set up a schedule because you couldn't have more than 10 out here at a time. Um, since we're a big enough area, they said we could have 10 at the lower fields and 10 in the upper fields. And we set up a, a two shifts. Um, each day, one from 8 to 9.30, one from 9.45 to 11.15. That way the first shift could leave, they wouldn't cross over with them, and we had to have strict rules for taking temperature and, and doing all of those things that you have to do to make sure everybody had to bring their own water instead of us providing it, bring their own trowel and their gloves. When volunteers first started coming, I think they were a little wary and a lot of people were very uncomfortable unless we monitored everybody and said, you know, you're a little too close, and, and, that, and that's a difficult situation to be in. You hate to address other adults and say, remember, you, you'd like to talk to your friends, but you have to have social distance. So that became, but that became easier because I think people realized that that was very important. I think everybody's been very respectful of the changes and, and has taken them in stride. They just pulled out all the stops to make everything as safe as possible for the interns, and surprisingly, uh, 18 out of 30 have already certified, which to me is amazing. Uh, Matt Horseman at the Ag Center graciously offered anybody who's really afraid to get out, take it again next year for free. And surprisingly, only four people took him up on that. And all four of those people had very severe health issues, so it was totally understandable. Everybody else is plowing along, and I'm just amazed that they've been able to do this and they've had fun. They've had, I had so many emails saying this has been a lot of fun. They've had to create a project garden to show our community how much you could put in a very small amount of space with a very limited budget. Three of those gardens are out at Edible Uprising and they have been the source of a lot of questions from people out at farmers markets. And so they're out there answering questions, masked, social distancing, everything very safe. Um, we have healing gardens at Carton and Carter House and we have a large vegetable garden out at the Ag Center. So those gardens have been flourishing. They're having a good time with it and I'm just amazed and so proud of how well they have done. It has just been wonderful. We have acquired a lot of new technology that I don't want us to lose. I want to continue to be able to offer Zoom talks uh, through the library whether we have an audience or whether somebody can dial in from home. And this is important for people in a nursing home, uh, homebound for some other reason, traveling. Um, so I think that's a technology I don't want to lose. And then the website team have really made huge strides in upgrading the website and making sure the information is available in an easy to find format. Facebook has launched. We have lots of interaction on Facebook. We get a lot of questions on Facebook. 
which is terrific because we can uh, we can answer right there or we can send them the link to the publication so I'd say our tech team has probably made the biggest strides forward at this particular point in time we have found just in Williamson County we found lots of ways we can interact so watch for those watch for those opportunities they're often hidden um, but you don't need to just go lock yourself in your home and forget that you are still a master gardener. They rely on us for information. Um, you know, social distancing, masks, I think these are all critically important, but I think we need to be aware of ways that we can bring them into our circle. We hope you enjoyed that beautiful project tour, as well as a really encouraging snapshot of some of the adaptations that Williamson County has made in this COVID year to continue to serve their community. We're going to finish with a little bit of celebration and an introduction. Hey, it's Natalie. We are here in Franklin, Tennessee to celebrate with the Williamson County Master Gardeners their Search for Excellence winning project, which is the educational project for their Speakers Bureau. And with us, here today, we have Taylor. Why don't you introduce yourself to Master Gardeners in Tennessee? Thank you, Natalie. Yes, I'm Taylor Reeder. I am the new horticulture agent here for Williamson County. I come not too far away um, from Alabama, so just across the state line, and I am very excited to be here and work with these wonderful volunteers and all the great projects they're doing in the community. We're really glad to have you a state or so up north. And so we will officially, at an appropriate distance, give the search for excellence shovel uh, to the library series talks. Yes. And um, so as we think about this COVID year, we have great um, teaching that takes place in speakers bureaus across the uh, state, but your folks and many others across the state have adapted a little bit this year. What are some of the ways that the library talks and the speakers bureau has changed from our more digital environment? Yeah, so I, w I wish Mary Pemberton could have been here. She's in charge of the speakers bureau project and even before I got here, they were making changes so that they could adapt to the virus and all the situations that are going on here and still serve the public and bring them those great educational talks they had been doing at the library. And the way that we've been doing that is what all of you have probably been watching and you may be watching on Zoom right now, um, but we've actually been doing some Zoom programs in conjunction with the library. So we've been working with the library here that they had normally spoken at and we have been doing everything virtually. So we've had two very successful talks so far. We have one scheduled awesome. for September as well. And then we are putting a call out there to all the Speakers Bureau, hoping that we can continue this as, you know, it's very uncertain right now how we're gonna be delivering our educational programs. So it's been great to do that virtually and still have a presence in the community and still keep this going. And it just shows the perseverance of our volunteers that they still wanna get out there. They still wanna do these great things in the community. And so they're adapting to situations like we have yeah. now. So great. It's there's, there's no holding our master gardeners no, back. No, there is not. So we're really glad that you've been able to join with us on this little video tour of some of the great things that are happening here in Williamson County. Thank you.